What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, Bike, to the headquarters. Welcome, Bike, to another episode with our favorite doctor out there, other than myself, Mr. Dr. Jesse Morse of the Fancy Doctors. Last Thursday, we broke down the quarterbacks. We, we broke down the running backs that we're a little bit nervous about going into 2020 fantasy football, what their injury concerns are, what level of concern we should have for them. So if you missed that, I'll link that in the description down below. Go check it out on the channel. Make sure you're following Dr. Morse because he gives all of his injury updates real time on Twitter if you want straight to your face hole. Today, we're going to wrap it up with the other positions. We have a few guys wide receivers, a few guys tight ends. We're not going to be able to get into every injury concern player, especially the guys that are more dynasty related, because for the most part, these Tuesday, Thursday videos are season long. So we're going to get into the grit of the guys that you may or may not be drafting in season long fantasy. Dr. Morse, how we doing, buddy? We're doing good. It's not raining today, thank God. I'm so uh, we, I rain. guess we it's took the rain fun. from you guys in uh, in New York here today. It's a There's so day. much flooding around here, dude. I freaking feel like I need to float. <laughs> that would be an interesting, uh, interesting commute to work. Blow up a little rafter and get over there. All right. All right. All right. Well, let's talk about some guys who might need rafters to get off the field this year. We'll start with uh, we'll start with one of the Coopers. You you can you can name your choice here if you want to go Amari Cooper or Cooper Cup. We'll start with Amari just because he's on my, the top of my head right now. Okay, so with Amari Cooper, I'd just like to preface real quick. You know, I'm in the middle of doing the wide receiver rankings, and what Doc says here will probably change the landscape of maybe how I did my rankings on Tuesday. Amari Cooper's got this, the theme around him is that he's wildly inconsistent. And I'm looking back on it, and yes, he's been inconsistent throughout most of the seasons that he's had. But I feel like most of them have to do, most of the inconsistent games have to do with the injuries that he's dealt with. So I can't really tell if he's actually inconsistent as a player. You know, if he goes against top talent, is that the problem? Or is it just that every time he goes on to the injury report, he gets an MRI on his knee or his ankle or, or whatnot? Like the next week is when he has a down game. And then the week after that, he goes for 150. So, Doc, injury concerns. He's had a lot of them. But are they the reason why he's inconsistent as a player, do you feel? That's, I think those are two different questions. Um, I, don't, I don't think that his inconsistencies correlate with his injuries. Okay. At least I don't know if I've broken it down by injury and say, all right, the injury happened then, then you look at his stats and so on and so forth. I didn't go that in depth. I just kind of did an overview of all of his injuries. Okay. Um, the kid's been a stud from the beginning. I, when I was doing my research, I thought it was fascinating. His high school quarterback, Teddy Bridgewater. Really? That was interesting, huh? Wow. Was Teddy yeah, in Miami. high school? My, he was from Miami. I mean, they both went to the same Miami high school. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he had to have made that. it if he made it to college, and he must have been decent if he made it to the NFL. So. I just wonder I just if he was like was... a game manager in that time. You know, everyone's like, oh, he's got no fucking arm. But I wonder if he was like, you know, I wonder if Teddy B was like a boss in high school or if he was just like a really I solid, mean, accurate thrower. I imagine Miami's like, got you know. stupid talent. Dalvin Cook, Devonta Fran. Like, there's so many guys that came out of Miami. So, like, you have to be a somebody to be a, the, the starting quarterback uh, in, on one of the teams. So and he also you know, went to he also went to Louisville, where we had yeah. another pretty good quarterback in the NFL that went to Louisville as well. So okay, back to the point though. Amari Cooper, what are we talking? Yeah. About? So okay, so um, he, he he as far back as thirteen, which is when he was at Alabama, he's had a big toe sprain, a, a turf toe likely. Uh, but the thing that we've started to see over and over again is his plantar fasciitis. So if anybody's had plantar fasciitis who's watching this, they know how awful this injury is. Um, plantar fasciitis is inflammation of the tendons or ligaments underneath the bottom of the foot. So think of my palm as the heel and think of my fingertips as the toes. Well, there's ligaments that connect these two. And um, they get really, really tight. And whenever you step out of bed in the morning, usually in the morning, uh, it's almost like you're walking on glass or like nails, like people I've had some crazy descriptions um, and it's really painful. Um, it gets a little bit better as you, the day goes on, but it never really goes away. Some people get it acutely and then it goes away in a couple of weeks. He's obviously been dealing with it uh, off and on for the past, what looks like five years. Yeah. So they described it in, uh, in, in December of 2015. Um, and they said he's been playing with it through most of the year. And the fact that he also, uh, they commented on it early in, in, in training last year means that he's he either had it again or he's had it the whole time and it continues to, to ebb and flow. Is it one of those this, things where it gets worse? Like if it's an acute problem, like it comes back, does it, you know, wear and tear on the tendons and then you hear about it? So, like if it is one where it goes back and forth. This is one of those that uh, it's kind of like back pain. 
it never really yeah. goes away. It just kind of calms down. Gotcha. If that makes sense. Um, plantar fasciitis is ridiculously frustrating. Albert Pujols, for you baseball fans, reportedly has been dealt with this for years, and he spends up to two to three hours per game, pregame, getting his foot ready to play in that game. Wow. That's how much this can be ridiculously painful. Um, some guys have surgery. Some guys uh, get uh, you know PRP injections, steroid, not a good idea. Um, a lot of stretching. There's a couple different things. But either way, I don't really expect him to, to be bothered by this. Just know that he's dealing with it, and he's probably got it down to a science by now. Okay. Um, overall, he's had a couple Nicky knack injuries, um, that, that are just tweaks, but he played through them. I mean, when you look at his, uh, his, uh, list of games played, uh, 2015, all 16, 2016, all 16, uh, 17, he missed two games, 18. He missed one game with a concussion after he went and he went over from da Oakland to Dallas. And then last year he played in all 16 games. So I mean, he's played yeah. in the majority of games. We just see this ebb and flow. So you're like, well, is he playing or is he, is he it's, just not? It's the problem. It feels like because he came out as such a, a pure talent, like a polarizing player. We figured he was going to hit his ceiling. And it seems like, you know, he, he is playing through all of these games. And when you look at the game log, you're right. I mean, three full seasons, one, one game missed, one season, two games, the other. It's like, why is he not performing up to that level? And in some part, it's like, okay, maybe that's just, maybe it's five years in and that's just who he is as a player. But it feels like every year we just make excuses for him as to why he's not elite. And then we get excited about why he's going to take the, the next step up. So like last year, I remember he came in, like we, we had talked about this late into the summer, plantar fasciitis, like they reported on it like late August. And I'm like, oh, that, that's something that I want to stay away from. Blows up the first three weeks. Then, he's, then he goes in for a random MRI on the knee and then it turns into a quad strain. And then he's got an ankle later on in the year. And it's like, becoming a shit show and I'm like Amari Cooper is uh he was someone I was gonna be really high on they drafted CD Lamb which I don't think really affects him let me ask you like are you okay with Amari Cooper as your wide receiver one in fantasy this year knowing uh not necessarily from the Dallas setup but like from an injury standpoint or I guess the consistency you shake your head no so I was I just finished my profile on him or pretty much finished it and at the end and I was writing like where is he being drafted and then I'm thinking all right would I be happy with him as my wide receiver one it really depends on the layout of my team. If um, I have some monster running backs um, and, and a monster tight end and, and an overall solid wide receiver group, then I'm okay with it. But if my if I have a solid wide receiver uh, running back one and then um, a decent mid-level uh, tight end, and I'm depending on Amari to go ham, I'm probably not. I'm probably going to be disappointed. I'd prefer to him to be my wide receiver two, which is yeah. uh, a little challenging. I mean. I mean, I'd take, you know, Nuke, uh, Tyreek, Julio, uh, Thomas, and uh, Devante uh, all before him. And then you're starting to talk about Galladay, you know, A-Rob. That, that's um, where my the dichotomy comes in. I'll, I'm taking DJ Moore over him. But when I get to, like, Kenny Galladay, Amari Cooper, like, Adam Thielen, that's where I start to, like, question, you know, all the clear-cut ones. But, like, the ceiling floor differences are – they get a little bit muddy. And I'm like, if he's the guy that's yeah. – the injuries as opposed to the rest of them maybe I'll just like you know I'll fade them yeah I mean and they obviously have a lot of talent to go around Jarwin I expect to have a good season Lamb should do something Gallup is solid uh yeah. Zeke is still there I'm assuming Pollard's going to get some touches I mean there's only so many touches to go around I mean how many can you realistically expect Cooper to have a games uh every you know every game where he goes um you know, 10 catches for 150 yards and a touchdown or two. No, like that's not. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not too, too worried about Cooper's involvement in the offense. Like I, I believe he'll operate as the alpha this year. And this is a, you know, an offense that almost threw for 5,000 yards. So I think he'll get his piece of the pie. I'm just like, you know, it's just like in an offense that's so prolific or at least was last year, like how come, how come he only barely outproduced Michael Gallup? And I guess it's, you know, just some of his as a player. I, I guess maybe we just have to we have to come to terms with, like, Amari Cooper's never going to be the, you know, 100 for 1,500 and, and 10 touchdown guy, you know? I mean, if you look at his, his game stats from, from 2019, he only – only four games did he catch over 100 yards receiving. One, he went bananas for, for 226. Um, but, um, you know, other games, 106, 106, 147. That's it. Yeah. Every other game he didn't, he went under a hundred. He scored touchdowns in his first three games. Uh, then in the fifth game, and then he had three more the rest of the season. Yeah. Five in the first five games. It was, it was so exciting right out of the gate. And that's why I'm like, okay, maybe it was the injury that happened early on, but I'm like the rest of the year, he had three games with two targets. He had 
two games with one catch, a game with zero catches. It's like, that's, you know, and, and those games, you know, it's against the Stefan Gilmore's and you're like, okay, he's getting locked down by the best cornerbacks. Maybe that's the reason, maybe he just isn't as talented. And that's the reason he keeps kind of topping off at like 1100 yards. So uh, to wrap up on Amari Cooper, the injuries are something that he's probably going to have to deal with, you know, maybe it's limiting his ceiling, maybe not, but it seems like there's probably something else there that, you know, just can't get him over, over the hill. Yeah, I mean, I'm not overly concerned about him. I just feel like he's kind of that 1B or 2A as opposed to the the, the true wide receiver at once. Yeah, I think he's going off the board at like wide receiver 10. So I, I guess the market kind of agrees on that. Now, flipping over to the other Cooper, Cooper Cup. So Cooper Cup was, I want to go on record on this, guys, because a lot of y'all just shit in the comment sections about Cooper Cup because I was telling y'all to avoid him last year. Doc, by the end of the summer, was much more on board with Cooper Cup as he was getting healthier and the reports were coming out. So do not blame him for the Cooper Cup fade. That was 100% on me. I was just thinking a guy coming out of the mid-year ACL, like late in the season, we always try to get them in the second year, right? This is like something that's usually the case. He happens to be the outlier here where he came back and busted off. The weird, weird part about Cooper Cup was that we heard nothing about, you know, he's two years removed now, so he should be all systems go. We didn't hear anything about the injury being a problem last year. And this is completely hypothetical to me. I want to know if you have any thoughts on it because he comes off of this game. He comes off of the monster game he had in, I think it was week eight or week nine last year, maybe. Um, It was seven catches, 220 yards, one touchdown. So you're like, okay, Cooper Cup, you know, he's like elite at this point in terms of the production that he's putting up for fantasy. He, he, he started off the year basically like Adam Thielen did the year prior. And then after that monster game, everything just windfalls downhill. His playing time gets cut in half. They go to more two tight end sets and he's sitting on the bench for most of them. And I'm like, okay, you don't, you don't have a receiver. I understand he's not as good on the outside as he is in the slot, but a guy coming off a seven for 220 yard game doesn't automatically get scaled back to a 40% player, in my opinion, unless there's something else to it. Do you think that maybe fatigue hit him with that ACL? I mean, he was only a, a year fully removed from it by like week eight or nine into the season. Like, what are your thoughts I on think this? That, I think that definitely played a role. I mean, if you uh, strip away all everything and just look at the numbers, sometimes that helps me. So if you were to say this guy caught 94 passes, 1,161 yards, in 10 touchdowns is that a good season hell yeah that's what he did last year Mm -hmm. why are you disappointed i mean do you think he was going to score 20 touchdowns do you think he's going to catch 2,000 yards it's not disappointment but it's 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 a tale of two halves the first half was incredible the second half was fucking almost terrible to be honest that's the problem is do we project the second half into next year or do we look at it like okay brandon cooks is gone now that's even bigger piece of the pie or what what i'm thinking as well from a strategy standpoint for the team mcveigh's a good offensive coach for as much as the shit people like to give him now he adapts to the offense that he has their offensive line started playing poorly they couldn't run the ball anymore that's when you put an extra tight end in there to block thus they go with more two tight end sets cooper cup is not as effective on the outside so these are the things that we need to think about going into next year he's not going to be that elite player we saw over the first half of the year but like could he be the adam Thielen, where he's still operating as the number one even on the outside like i I don't i don't know if the acl played a part in why it's just like how do you take someone who had such a beast game and then just scale him back to like 45 percent of the snaps it's so weird to me so let's go back and look at his injuries so preseason 2017 he had a groin strain Annoying, but okay. Week five, 2018, concussion. They happen. 2018, left knee MCL sprain. Foreshadowing. Missed two games. November 2018, torn ACL, left knee. So he had a predisposing injury, came back after two or three weeks, which is Mm semi-reasonable, only to suffer a torn ACL in the same knee not long after. So unfortunately, um, that you see how that plays out. Now we know at two years, within the next two years, he has a 21% chance of tearing his opposite ACL, which would be his right ACL, and a 9% chance of tearing his left ACL again, or the the graft again, combining for 30%. That's the data. So, um, in terms of um, his risk is about to drop, but it's going to be most of this season that he's still quote, quote, not a hundred percent. He will be better in terms of healthiness this year um, as opposed to last year. So uh, when we look at 
and, and, and for what it's worth, I just pulled up the, the exact dates. He suffered the MCL sprain on October 14th. Mm -hmm. He missed uh, probably the rest of that game in two more games. Less than a month later, November 11th, he tore his ACL, the left ACL. Mm -hmm. So did he rush back too soon? You, you, it begs the question. Either way, he ended up playing all the games last year. He ended up having um, – a, a decent season, uh, you know, it, don't, it depends on expectations. But when you look at it, 100%, I mean, the first six, seven games where he went, uh, you know, uh, first five games, he went nuclear. Then he, then week eight, he went absolutely bananas against Cincinnati with that uh, seven for 220 and one. But then he comes out of the bye and he doesn't catch any passes. Yeah. Then he catches three for 53. You know, the uh, artist totals he, are just so suspect after going for 100 yards and like, you know, six out of the first seven games or whatever the fuck the, the numbers were. You know what I mean? That, and that's what's like so weird. And everyone, you can attribute it, obviously, to the two tight end sets. But if that's the case, like, why would Cooper Cup, being the athlete that he is, come off the field in two, two wide receiver sets? I think that they, I wonder if there's any specific timing or somebody's probably going to have it of, of his, uh, his breaks, like how quickly he was breaking at the beginning of the year and how quickly he was breaking in, you know, out of a, out of a route in week 10 or something like that. I'd be curious mm -hmm. to see if that played a role in it. These guys wear down as the season goes on. I mean, you, you kind of have to, if you've been playing grinding three, four, five days a week, uh, you know, for 10 weeks straight, um, it wears on you. Um, yeah. Add travel, add, you know, these guys uh, usually don't sleep the best, unfortunately. So, I mean, he had a good season last year, but it was, you know, it, it was disappointing depending on w what you thought of him. Well, it's like you, um, you know, the, the, what could have killed you is like, you know, you feel like you got an elite wide receiver one in cup for the first half of the year, then maybe, you know, maybe you drafted uh, another wide receiver and you traded him for a running back, you know, or some shit like that, expecting cup to be your wide receiver one. And then he killed you over the second half of the year, you know, and obviously that's just based, one nuance to it, but. Based on the way we're talking, where do you think he finished in 2019 in terms of total wide receivers in PPR? In PPR? Uh, I would mm -hmm. say he was probably like the wide receiver seven, maybe eight. Four. Four. Okay. He finished with more points than DeAndre Hopkins. Makes sense. He was just front loaded. Yeah. So you got all your points in the beginning of the season. You didn't get as many in the end. But the last five games or whatever, he scored a touchdown in each game. So, you know, like Michael Thomas was like the CMC. He, he was on his own level. Then you had Godwin, uh, Joe, Julio, and Cup, and uh, Nuke all within 10 points. I mean – yeah. So he was there. It was just our, our the dichotomy of the first and the second. Um, but remove Brandon Cooks and his concussion proneness. We'll talk about him on a different video at a different time. Um, you remove Gurley, who's now in Atlanta. We talked about the other day. Um, you know, they still have some some talent around them that are that is new. But I, do they go more uh, to receiver sets? Um, or two uh, tight end sets, you know, how much are they using Cam Akers? How much are they going to use Henderson and Malcolm Brown? Um, you know, Woods is still the number one wide receiver there. So in my Cup, opinion. Cup right now is going off the board at 41 overall uh, wide receiver 13. So that's like mid fourth round, early to mid fourth round. And that's, you know, you, you could have him as your wide receiver too. You feeling comfortable with Cup as your wide receiver too? With those numbers? Yeah. yeah. I mean, here's the way I look at it. Okay. Would you rather have Cooper Cup or T.Y. Hilton? Uh, Cup, for sure. Would you rather have Cooper Cup or D.K. Metcalf? Cup. It's a close. It's relatively close, but if you're playing PPR, I'd probably still go Cup. Would you rather have um, Cooper Cup or Keenan Allen? And we don't even know who's throwing to him. Yeah, I'm going to take Cup there, too. Have the guys that he's going around, he's going right behind. Uh, okay, well, it, it's C Cooper Cup in the ADP, and then there's like six guys in a row that are wide receivers. So it's Cup, yeah. Juju, Thielen, A.J. Brown, Calvin Ridley, Court, and Sutton. I think when you're in that situation, that category – like, I, th I think there's a real argument to make Adam Thielen over Cup. Uh, I personally probably wouldn't take Juju over Cup, but if you're, if you're banking on a big bounce back, like you said, you know, you're, you're expecting Ben to be pretty healthy. And if, if Juju's going to get back into the slot, I think he could end up with similar numbers to Cooper Cup. So when you look at it, like with, through those guys, I mean, it's, it's Cooper Cup. Do we take the risk that they do 
do two tight end sets more often in, in 2020 and cut maybe a scale back from a 95% guy. You got to remember when, when McVay took the, the league by storm, it was because he was running three wide receiver sets on like 95% of his plays and not a damn defense in the league could stop this dude. Cooper cup was in on, on those 95 plays because he was a slot. You got three wide receivers, two on the outside cup in the middle, but if they need to adjust their game plan to assert more linemen in to protect golf, cause he's terrible under pressure. You can't have a shitty old line in front of golf. Yeah. You got to add the second tight end in. What happens to that slot role? There is no more slot role because you got two tight ends, two outside, one running back. That's that's the question at hand. And and they didn't really upgrade their offensive line, which is what really makes me nervous in the overall scheme of things, you know? I mean, I think the talent's there. I think uh, yeah. in terms of healthiness, I think it's there. Okay. Um, um, I, you know, I would take them over a lot of the guys we talked about. The, the, the gray area is kind of that Debo, Samuel, A.J. Brown, Sutton, Chark, maybe. Yeah, I'm going to um, take Cup over all those guys for sure. Because he's kind of like that. That's that area where, like, mm, okay, I'll think about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But, I'll, you know, I'd happily take any of the guys we talked about earlier, you know, Tyreek, Nuke, uh, Thomas, Adams, um, uh, and then Godwin's Evans is depends on how you feel about the new comments about 12 yeah. by receiver, you know, 12, 12 sets. But, uh, but, but he's in the discussion for wide receiver one potential ceiling or, or a floor of wide receiver two yeah so it's a it's a no. good it's a good player to round out your roster but i'm not going to be expecting the first half of the season numbers now i think we could probably expect a, a few more numbers on the box score for a guy like aj green who put up zero numbers last year this is like doc i gotta tell you this is like my most proud player that we talked about all summer we you know from like from like february we're like aj green ain't playing this year aj green is is fucked the entire year as summer went by people were like he's such a good value in the fourth round we're like he ain't playing he ain't playing he ain't playing he doesn't play at all now I will gladly change my tune on A.J. Green if he is back on the field. A year more recovered. He had the terrible foot injury. But if you think that this is something at his age where he has got to be over 30, 31 years old now, that was obviously a very serious foot injury that cost him the majority of the year. Of course, he just sat out for some of the year just on his own uh, chagrin. But now that he's a little bit older, uh, will was the rest very welcome to his body? Or do you think he's going to have a lot of – a lot of trouble getting back into like the momentum, the swing of things. He's got Joe Burrow coming in, exciting offense, probably uh, AJ green. What do you think? Like, I'm not even going to hear anything about his ceiling being wide receiver one. I just, I just won't believe it. But you know, if he's a value pick as like a top 15, maybe wide receiver, like 19 or some shit in that range. What are your thoughts on that? Age 32 season. Yeah. So he's starting to, you know, he's in the Julio area. He's, they both were drafted very similarly. Um, uh, the tricky part with green is that I still don't have clarity about exactly what the injury was. They've never specifically commented on what the injury was. Uh, so that's hard for me to kind of give you a good estimation or, or, or medical advice when we don't know exactly what we're dealing with. Um, you know, he, 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 he did it in late July it was either a grade two, which is severe, or grade three, which is a full thickness tear. My suspicion is he had, a, 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 it was on the ankle. It, it was either a large uh, bone fracture that came off that was attached to a ligament or both the tear of the ligament and fracture. It was probably that because um, he would have came back likely or throughout the year if it was just the fracture. He probably would have put a pin in it. Um, and he would have been okay. So my suspicion is there was some soft tissue injury that kept lingering, and that's why he kept having setbacks. And then whenever he tried to ramp up, he would swell, and then he just – it was a big cycle. Um, the question then becomes, we look at his previous history, and like, he's had some issues here. Um, he had uh, a right hamstring and, and uh, strain in week 11 of 16 that he missed the rest of the season. So that's kind of a long time. Um, groin strain in, in, in 2018, not a big deal. And then he starts having this turf toe injury on the right foot. Um, this is the opposite one that he dealt with last year. So he had he missed three games in October. And then what does he do? He re-injures it in December and misses the final four games. So he basically misses seven or eight games, depending on whether or not you include the game he actually played in. Uh, so it's like that is a whole missed season in, in 18. So it's like, I just when I can't imagine and we had good AJ Green. Yeah, I can't imagine investing anything earlier than like a double digit round pick on AJ Green. Like my philosophy at this point in fantasy is pretty simple. It's like draft good young players going into their prime, 
don't hope for old players coming back off serious injuries to regain their form. It's just not how the NFL works, man. Once you're out of your prime, it is a slippery slope to try to climb back up there. And you see so many players push themselves via injury, via whatever they need to do. And uh, they end up slipping further and further down. So green, well rested, but like he, he's where he's going right now. I think he's like pick 70. Uh, so he's generally kind of early. That's still in the sixth round. I, I definitely won't be pulling the trigger on him in the sixth round. I, I would wait later on into drafts, get someone with, uh, I don't know, more, a more enticing opportunity or someone that's stayed healthy or at least someone that, you know, you can depend on. I mean, so how about we do this? Allen Robinson is being technically drafted in the same area, if not after him. Uh, no question even, in my mind. I'd take close. I would take A-Rob like four rounds before, five, probably like eight rounds before AJ Green. I, I would take Gallup. I would take Woods. Um, Woods definitely. Gallup, I think. I'd take, is, is I'd take Hollywood. Range. We'll we'll talk about Hollywood in a sec, but I'll take Hollywood over him. Mm-hmm. Cooks, I want nothing to do with. I take Scary Terry oh, or F1, yeah. whatever the hell you want to call him. I would put AJ um, Green behind all those. I think like the Michael Gallup situation is probably the best argument because I think at his ceiling, AJ Green could pop off for like a thousand yards. But if we're going to draft him, like he's going to be the AJ Green of fucking, you know, 92 for 1400 and 10 touchdowns. Like you, you're, uh, you're out of your, you're out of your mind right now. So let's, let's actually touch on, let's touch on Hollywood there. So Hollywood, ex- extremely exciting, explosive player as a rookie last year, first wide receiver drafted off the board. And a lot of people are quick to kind of pencil him in as this one trick pony, this deep threat, but he's, you know, he's a legit baller. He's a playmaker. The problem was he had the Liz Frank injury like leading up to the combine. We didn't get to see him run. And then pretty sure it lingered throughout most of the year. They were very limited on, on the, the snaps that he has. Uh, so I'm curious to hear your perspective on uh, not only the injury, is he fully healed? Uh, what do you think about him as like a talent too? Is he a guy that you'll be targeting in fantasy this year? Oh, this kid's, this kid's talented. He is, he's got loads of potential. Yep. Um, I remember reading his story. I don't know if I have it up in front of me, but um, he, he's got loads of talent. I mean, he's a little dude. He's like my, he's smaller than me. I mean, oh, he's, he's got about an me, inch yeah. on me, but he's like 170 pounds. Maybe he's 180 now, which is, uh, you know, roughly where I'm at. But so, I mean, he's going to be 24 this season or he just turned 24 yesterday, he's 23 yesterday. Yeah. Sorry, 23 yesterday. Um, here's the thing. This foot bothered him significantly, and he still had a respectable season. He caught 46 passes, 584 yards, seven touchdowns in 14 games. Mm -hmm. The problem is, and Harbaugh admitted it uh, the end of January, Marquise was rarely at 100% in 2019. And when I looked at his, uh, the times he was on the injury report, the times he missed games, it was a lot. He actually was banged up more than he was healthy. Um, you know, so what happened? He, he suffered a Liz Frank fracture in late 2018, December, December 1st. Um, and, and Liz Frank is the major ligament that controls the middle of the foot. So think of it as uh, the top of a bridge. So the, the crux of the bridge. Mm-hmm. Um, if you were to... Uh, substantially weaken the top of a bridge would you drive over it with your car of course not so while they stabilized it with a screw that every time you push off every time you step down the foot wants to flex and the screw is trying to hold that thing back up so he did as well as he could with what he was dealing with this is a speed guy but he's got great hands and he's just we, his explosive speed is ridiculous mm-hmm. um but the good thing is in late February of this year, he had it removed. He had the screw removed, which is good. If it didn't, if they were still having some lines of fracture or instability, they would have never removed it. A lot of these guys, they don't feel 100% back to normal until the screw is removed because it just feels funny. They can okay. tell that things aren't normal in there, and they're not. That He has a big freaking screw that it wouldn't normally be in there. So the good news is that um, – I think uh, we saw a taste of what he has potential to do. Right. Um, but, but I think this is the next level from him. I, I think he has a chance to be even more explosive this year. Um, it, 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 we saw last year, he, he didn't even feel like he was on the field half the time. Uh, if you watched any of the games, you're like, where, where is this guy? When he catches the ball, he's, he's like lightning in a bottle. But yeah, you, you got to think Andrews was catching the ball more than, you know. 
Yeah, you got to think they're going to go into this year with with at least a portion of their game plan to get the ball in this kid's. I mean, everything that they've done over the last two years has literally just been to put speed on the field. Lamar Jackson, J.K. Dobbins, Hollywood, Mark Andrews, Devin Duvernay is a four three nine guy. Uh, Miles Boykin. Not all of them worked out, obviously, but the clear the clear thing that they're trying to do is is throw these speed guys on the field. And Marquise is a guy who, with the screw in his foot, like you said, like exploded uh, when he was on the field. It seemed like you know. Didn't play a lot of snaps, was inconsistent production-wise. But, I mean, when they got the ball in his hand, it's like he did something that you, you don't typically see NFL players do. And when that happens, I mean, they're a smart coaching staff over there in Baltimore. They, they know how to get the ball in the right players' hands. And I'd imagine that that becomes a big piece of their game plan for 2020. So, I'm with you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty high on Hollywood this year. He's risky. I will tell you that. If there is somebody that is brittle, it's him. Yeah. Okay. Luck, well, luckily, like, redraft, he, he's not really going that high. People aren't. Um, yeah. they're, they're more scared of the floor than they are excited about the ceiling. I think when it he's comes definitely to got boom or bust potential, but I think his floor is still pretty stable. Yeah. I, I think that's you know? the guy. I think those are the guys you go for. Like you, you, you want to build your, the core of your team, right? The first four or five rounds with guys that will continue to give you production, say safer guys. Obviously they all have upside when they're in the first five rounds, but you want those guys to be less risk averse. When you get to round seven, eight or nine, you want to take the high upside guys that might be sitting on your bench. You're going to be able to drop them. If you don't want them anyways, you don't want floor plays because they're not doing you anything when they're on the bench. So I think, Hollywood's a fantastic late round pick now a guy that you're gonna have to invest a little bit more into sort of a polarizing player who, who dropped to the 511 in the dynasty startup that I'm in right now that's Odell Beckham so Odell Beckham there's a lot of moving parts here I mean there's the fact that like he played last year and just wasn't really good with Baker uh, Jarvis was like the number one there and then it comes out, he has, he has this offseason, like, core surgery, I believe, dealing with something all of last year. It seems like this is the theme every single year, that the season ends. Someone says that OBJ was dealing with an injury. He, he tweets out a video of him working out, and then everybody goes, oh, it's OBJ's year coming in. I know you've, you've been a longtime skeptic of OBJ and his, uh, his injury concerns, like, year over year going into fantasy. I remember this dating back for a couple of years now. Um, and he has proven you right for the most part. And last year, I can't help but to think, like, was it the injury or was this just a weird fucking fit for everyone in Cleveland? Let's review his injuries. Since 16, he's had a thumb, a hip strain, a thumb sprain, high ankle sprain, left ankle fracture um, that required uh, surgery, which means he lift, missed 11 games, quad injury, missed four games. Then all of last season, he had a sports hernia, reportedly. Um, he still played all 16 games. Hats off. But out of 133 targets, he caught 74? Yeah. Really? It's not, like, it's not like he's, a, it's not like he's a, uh, a Hollywood Brown guy where those targets are all, you know, 40 yards down the field and you expect a low catch percentage. That's what I mean. Like, it was just – it was just – it felt like him and Baker were just trying to throw a fucking square peg into a round hole, man. It just was – it was weird. I feel, I feel like they're ind individually, they're super talented. I just don't know if the cohesion is there. I mean, yes. now you're adding one, two, maybe even three tight ends. So you got Hooper that you still got into Joku. And then they, they took my, my, my boy Harrison Bryant from FAU, my undergrad. You mm -hmm. still got Chubb. You still got Hunt. Uh, Landry's still there where we'll talk about his hip sometime in the future. Um, I, I don't, he's their wide receiver one. But it's going to be weird are, because with all those tight ends, it, it's going to be Stefanski coming over. Their base offense is likely going to be two tight ends. That's probably why they signed Austin Hooper. They have David and Joku. They have, uh, as you said, they, they picked up Ryan in the draft, who's very talented. Now, they're going to play these two tight ends, and that means Jarvis is going to play on the outside, which is not probably the most comfortable position for him. Odell maybe becomes the alpha on the outside. They're going to use Kareem Hunt a ton in the passing game. Like, I don't know how this is going to work out. I do know this is going to be – much more run heavy this year with the fancy coming in which you know I don't know the efficiency wasn't there for Odell now we're gonna maybe take away the volume it's just it's not someone I'm, I'm looking for in the third round probably not even really the fourth round to be honest with you maybe I'll take him in one spot just to kind of diversify my player tree but he's not gonna be a, he's not gonna be a target for me is he someone that you're like maybe targeting based on value or no there's three guys four guys around him that I'd had rather have over him DJ Moore Definitely. Devontae Parker, Cortland Sutton, and Christian Kirk. Interesting. You would take Kirk over OBJ. Kirk is 
so what I think Kyler is going to do this year is going to be like fireworks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think between – if they – so you're going to have to pick your poison. Either I like I like Kenyon. Kirk as a value. He's dropping far now that Hopkins is there. People are like, oh, Kirk is kind of like, no way he can be the alpha, but he's dropping. I love him as a value. I mean, either you get you have to deal with Kenyon, either you deal with Nuke, or you deal with Kirk, and you still have Kyler out of the backfield and he can run. So it's yeah. like, uh, you and they want to pass the ball 50, 60 times a game. Like mm-hmm. the ball's got to go somewhere. Nuke's got not going to be able to catch all of them uh, because they're going to bracket them, and, and and Kirk's going to be like, hello. So and then you still have. Uh, Grandpa Fitz, who's a Hall of Famer waiting. So it's like th- there's going to be uh, – I, I, I'm excited about Kirk this year um, j- because uh, there is another commanding presence in Nuke. Yeah. Nuke will get you, as we know that. Um, but I just – OBJ, I just don't know if we'll ever put it together. Individually, he's uber talented. We know that. He makes yeah. crazy catches. I, I feel like we're still riding on that catch he made, and we're just like – that that's who he is right as long as he gets on the field for a full 16 we're gonna see that over and over and i'm like at this point you have to understand but that he did that last cool. year yeah like exactly. all 16, that's what i'm you know? saying yeah that that's my concern i'm like i'm not even i don't even know if i'm concerned about injuries anymore or if this cleveland thing is just not gonna work out between him and baker man like there's already rumor there was reports all off season about how they were looking to trade him don't know if they were true or not but usually where there's smoke there's fire so it's like i don't know something's weird there with with odell and he's someone that i'm i, I am probably going to be staying away from him and uh and and will fuller who stays away from hamstrings basically the way i stay away from obj i'm I'm assuming you are yeah i mean you good sorry i thought you had a call or something going on like some real life shit yeah no i just answered i i declined i don't know where what it's yeah, for what it's coming from decline. you tell him you're in the headquarters uh he um so uh, fuller <laughs> this guy do we really even need to talk about it? Like, we could just say he's a huge injury risk, and if he's on the field, he'll play well. But, like, who cares? So Is that good enough as a doctor? I, I'd i love to, but unfortunately, I think your fans want to know more because I've had several debates <laughs> with people the past couple of yeah. weeks saying, like, he's worth it for those two games. I'm like, well, which two games are they going to be? Yeah, true. Like, okay, so we'll, we'll do Will Fuller in about a minute. Uh, let me find him on my sheet. Okay. Um since week since 2016 i'm going to list his injuries by week hamstring hamstring re-injury left knee sprain broken clavicle broken ribs knee surgery hamstring strain right acl tear hamstring strain missed three and a half games hamstring re-injury missed another game sports hernia head off season surgery Some really, dudes are just they're just not built for the nfl man and will fuller uh seems to seems to be that He's 26. You ever had people come into your office and just be like, you got to stop doing physical activity? You ever told someone that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm like, I know you want to be active, but you, I need to like it's not good put you, you in bubble wrap. I'm yeah. going to put you in bubble like like, like, like that. The bubble man on, on Seinfeld, if you've ever seen that episode, like that one, like the, the, you're, you're injury prone. Um, but like this guy is, if it's not his hamstring, it's some other knickknack injury. Like we know he's explosive, but – you know who another guy who's injury prone and explosive that they just picked up? Brandon Cooks. They just they they're monopolizing guys. Uh, they figure that they might be able to piece together uh, one downfield threat for 16 games for Deshaun Watson. I don't know what the fuck they're doing in Houston, bro. It's bad. It's, it's so, so bad. bad. It's so bad. It's so, I want nothing to do with Will Fuller this year unless he comes to me at like the. 10th round or some crazy 12th round just something and i'm like yeah i, just, I guess that's a good value. yeah i pass on him i pass on him in the uh what was it the 11th 11th round in my dynasty startup and i mean he's still like relatively young and tied to a, an elite quarterback so that should tell you about how much i how good i feel about him let's switch over and uh wrap this up as quickly as we possibly can we had two tight ends but i i only have evan ingram here but i remember i threw out another tight end in the, in the chat that i wanted to Touch on who was it again? Remind me, Doc. Gronk. Gronk. Okay. Okay. Let's start with Gronk. Let's start with Gronk. You're a Patriots man over there. So Gronk has dealt with so many injuries, you know, leading up to his his retirement last year. Is this uh, a case of where Gronk just really needed the rest and he's gonna come back and be like good for the season? I'm I'm so torn. I'm I'm like going back to the case I make where, you know, don't draft players who are old coming off of injuries, but I'm like, maybe. Like Gronk is not 
uh, he's not a running back. He's not Le'Veon Bell where he's coming back from the rest and he needs to be extremely explosive. Like he just needs to be a really good red zone target for, for Tom Brady. He doesn't need to take the pressure off the defense with Godwin, with Evans, with all these players that they already have. Uh, a lot of people are getting excited about Gronk as like a top 10, top eight tight end option. Uh, will you be targeting him in season long drafts? Mm, probably not because his name value is going to drive him high enough where he's not going to be a value anymore. Yeah. So when I look at it, they still have Brait. They still have Howard. They still have Evans. They still have Godwin. They got a new uh, rookie in with Tyler Johnson. And they have, what, two, three running backs? Like, how many different places can the ball go here? Yeah. So, it, like, hypothetically. I think, I think what if, we're hoping for with Gronk, it's like we're hoping for, like, a weekly, you know, four for 50 kind of game with him, three for 50 kind of game with him, and he scores a touchdown, like, every other week and ends up as, the you know, the tight end eight on the season. I don't think we can ever – uh, imagine Gronk getting back to like the shape he was in before but like have you ever uh, uh at, with athletes have you ever dealt with someone like that who has gone because his, his body image you know went all sorts of fucking directions he was a, you know an NFL player a real NFL tight end fucking massive he lost a lot of weight you know and got skinny and yeah. he, he looked like he was enjoying his life and I was like Gronk just live your best life man don't come back to the NFL they don't need you he comes back to the NFL and he starts putting a little bit more muscle on. Like, do these body transformations, in your opinion, uh, take a toll on maybe future injuries or anything like that? The best predictor of future injury is past injury. Okay. So I've never seen an injury list as crazy as Gronkowski's. It's ridiculous. Like, this guy has had so many different things. It's insane. I mean, remember, he had – spinal surgery for a severely ruptured herniated disc in his low back before he le ever left the university of Arizona before most of us have ever heard of him. He then, you know, then he's talking about high ankle sprains groin pulls. He fractured his arm twice. He required four surgeries. He had another back fracture or, or, or another vertebral fracture. Um, so he ended up getting surgery again. Then he tore his ACL. Then he tore his MCL at the same time. He's had concussions. He's bruised his lungs. I mean, he's had another surgery, probably more than one. So it's like it, the thing about being in when he was in New England, when I was uh, constantly watching, is that he was the target there. We yeah. knew when Gronk was on the field, he was going to get the ball more often than not. You can't say that anymore in, in, in Tampa. There's too many mouths to feed. If they double Gronk, whoever the other right, uh, tight end on the board uh, uh, on the field is going to go, or, or Godwin's going like, to be available, Evans, or like. I feel like OJ Howard, low key, might be a, a really good tight end two target because, well, might be the better is, pick. They come out and report that Bruce Arian says that this their base offense this year is going to be two tight ends, and everyone gets excited. And then, literally, right under that, someone screenshotted a tweet from last year of a report of Bruce Arian saying our base offense in 2019 is going to be a two tight end set. So it's like, okay, we can believe what you're saying. Maybe not, but I, I do think they're going to use OJ Howard uh, a lot more. And he's just too athletic not to, I think, get involved when everybody else is, no one's going to be paying attention to OJ Howard anymore when you have Gronk and those guys on the field. But I'm disappointed that the Patriots couldn't get him from him. I, mm. I would have been an exciting ad for you guys. I do like the two tight ends that you guys did uh, draft though this year. Oh Don yeah, Keenan of course. I, I mean, here's the problem brace a good tight end too yeah. i mean it's like good red zone uh, target yeah and so it's like gronk i just don't think it's going to get the volume to be able and you're going to be touchdown dependent on gronk okay i mean that's what, that's he's one hit over the middle he's one weird angle i mean you, you i i can remember him being run excuse me running down the field with people like literally trying to drag him down like he's such a physical monster that he's so awkward to bring down, but you know, and he lands on these awkward, you know, angles on his knee, on his forearm. He's wearing like braces on his knee and braces on his arm. It's the, like the fucking braces he wears weighs as much as he does. Yeah. It's so funny uh, watching him brace up for it. You know, what's funny is that when I wrote up his profile, I had no idea how smart he was. Like this dude was gifted. He had a 1560 on his SAT out of 1600. He had to have cheated on that. There's no, I do not believe that Gronk put up a 1560. I think he's just one of those goofy dudes that is silently brilliant and can learn <sighs> offenses quick. He's just goofy. Like, that's just who he is. I find that I so know. hard to believe. I know. Maybe, I, know I mean, maybe you're right, but like just listening to him talk sometimes, it's like, 
there are times yeah. where you hear him and you're like, okay, I feel like he's almost someone who I don't want to like be mean to Gronk, but he's like a rain man in a way. When it comes to football, he's so, so smart. But when you hear him talk about other things, you're like, yo, like you are totally lacking any like sense of self-awareness <laughs> about what you're fucking saying right now. It's so odd, you know, but like you just love Gronk because he's, he's kind of harmless when it comes to that other shit. So Gronk. Agreed. Be wary. Tight end. Number two. Be very wary. Evan Ingram. We talked about the Liz Frank injury at Marquise Hollywood Brown. Evan Ingram is coming off of a Liz Frank surgery. Uh, I believe it happened in February. He was in a walking boot still in March. I'm not really sure if there have been any updates since then. Uh, we talked about the screw in Hollywood's foot. Evan, when you get a Liz Frank, do you automatically have that screw in there? And is there a certain timetable that you always have it in for? So if you require surgery, you get a screw. Okay. If you, um, if you sprain the hell out of it, uh, then you can hold off. This is what happened to Cam. But most of the time, it just doesn't. They, they don't heal like you want them to, and you end up going to surgery. Um, here's my issue with Ingram. This guy can't stay healthy to save his life. Like, he's so talented. I just wish he could stay healthy. I mean – you know, he's had MCL sprains. He's now he's he damages his um, Liz Frank. So what is the data for Liz Frank's show? Um, 80% return to sport within 29 weeks. Okay. 87% pre-injury value, pre, pre-injury level of play. So uh, not quite a hundred percent, but almost 90%. But, uh, almost 70% of them have occasional persistent pain. And it's not like, oh, it's a one out of 10. They actually rated it a four out of 10. So it's kind of like annoying. Um, running and walking are challenging with this. And he's going to have similar issues that Hollywood had where this thing's just going to feel a little funky. It's going to be hard because he's got a screw in his foot and it's just not something that's comfortable here's the problem. He's already missed 30% of the games that he could have possibly played in. Yeah. He's missed like a full season since entering the league. 14 out of 48. Like that's mm -hmm. almost a whole season, you know? Um, yes. He's an elite catch, uh, you know, uh, uh, catching tight end when he's healthy, but he's never healthy. Yeah. Give me someone that's more, give me Higby, you know, give me someone that's, that's safer with just as much upside. Um, you know, I feel like every year I feel like the tight ends get, bigger in terms of uh in terms of um the number of guys that good. we think we like gets bigger but they all end up like fucking be terrible anyways it's but at like, the it, end of the year it's like there's three guys and it's yeah. always like three guys mm -hmm. you know That's why the best so is, is just drafting like two of the tight ends that are in the tight end eight to like 15 range hope that one of them pops off if you miss on yeah. on the early round tight end so we're definitely nervous about evan ingram this year um definitely i want no interest no no interest in him at all okay. uh, my he is one of the highest risk guys i have Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, coming off the list, Frank. So very serious and obviously late. And it's not like he had it early on in last season, missed the season and recover. Coming out in the off season, having that. And now we have a timetable uh, to recover from. So follow reports closely, but it's not a good outlook for Evan Ingram. Um, that's all we got for y'all today. Uh, as always, Dr. Morse is working very hard over there on his 2020 injury guide. You could find that patreon.com slash 2020 Injury, injury guide draft guide i think it's what yeah i just wrote I just, just it's, wrote, it's wrote, linked wrote, right yeah. below dr morse right there you can see yeah. it up on the screen uh you can go you can go cop it over there to support him you can get individual profiles as well if you just want to know one or two of the players his draft guide will also be available in the big dogs draft guide so you can cop that either through bigdogsdraftguide.com or on monkey knife fight if you use the promo code bdge when you sign up with 10 bucks you will get the dynasty rookie guide the season-long guide his injury guide all of the above uh, I hope you guys found a lot of valuable information in today's featured film. Doc, thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Make sure you are following all of his work on Twitter as well as our YouTube channel, always linked below in the description. Doc, I'm going to let you go and, uh, and head back to saving the world for us. Thank you for joining us. Take care. We'll see you soon.